Uh, welcome to the talk uh, and thanks for attending the session. I'm just going to go over my details for the next one minute, so uh, not that important. Uh, so yeah, let's start. Uh, uh, hi, I'm Shayok. Uh, I work on diffusion models at a company called Hugging Face. It's literally the emoji. Uh, can't help it. The emoji is within the company name. So again, ask our founders what they were thinking, but it is what it is. I'm quite deep into open source. I'm also big into a very unpopular sport called cricket, mostly played by 12, 15 nations. Uh, and also, my personal details are available on my personal site. Uh, and before we start, some, some trivia. This is my first time speaking at OSS's uh, Japan. And this is also my first time visiting Japan. Uh, I love it. Uh, amazing city, Tokyo. I, and no one told me to you know, come with a bank, because Tokyo is full of exciting stuff. And I think I shopped a lot. So <laughs> hopefully customs clear, clears it. Uh, I'll share my slides uh, after my talk ends. Uh, and if I'm going too fast or too slow, please ask me to adjust accordingly, and, and I'll try to accommodate uh, my best. And there will hopefully be time for question and answers at the end. So yeah, that's about the logistics stuff uh, and about the talk. I'm going to talk about image generation and video generation, but not the mathematics side of it. How you can do image generation and video generation for your own projects using the library that I help co-maintain uh, at Hugging Face, which is Diffuses. I'm, of course, going to talk about the library and its potential. I'm also going to discuss a couple of Pythonic aspects of the library, and then hopefully we'll have time for Q&A. But I'll be in the conference, so feel free to grab me even after my talk ends. That's absolutely fine. So yeah, let's finally start, uh, hopefully. Uh, so I entered the era of text-to-image diffusion models. I hope everyone uh, has heard of things like DALI 3, Midjourney. Can I get a show of hands uh, who has heard about DALI 3 or Midjourney? Even things like Sora, oh, okay, that's 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 quite a quite a good number. So with Stable Diffusion three, uh, we have got phenomenal results. Then we have got Pixar Alpha, and then we have got Flux. And something to startle here is that I mean, a tiny astronaut hatching from an egg on the moon is it even possible in reality? But but these models <laughs> have this exceptional ability of you know making sense of the prompt that we are giving to them, and come up with something as realistic as the image on the right hand side, like a baby astronaut. Can we even think about a baby astronaut? Like who, who think, thinks about being an astronaut when they were five? So, and also a transparent sculpture of of a duck, uh, a small cactus tree smiling. I think these are all very you know elevating uh, and free thoughts uh, that we are getting to see more visually with this uh, diffusion models. And also Sora, of course. When in Tokyo, how can I miss this video? Right, this is the popular. Uh, Sora video from OpenAI, and I think this is also pretty remarkable, isn't it? Also, think about the prompt the pr from the, on the right hand side that generated the video. This video is a generated video, mind you. This is not something that was taken from YouTube. It's a generated video by a diffusion model from OpenAI, and it was generated using this prompt. And try to you know pay attention to the prompt that generated it. As human beings, I think we can agree that we will have hard time parsing the prompt. But you know these models have this ability to you know parse them and generate videos for us. So that's pretty good. And then we have got Mochi, which was released like three four days back. It's an open model, unlike Sora. Sora is a closed model. You you, you, we can't even access Sora. It was only released to a couple of beta testers. But Mochi, it's an open video generation model. And we can see the quality. So we've come a long way. Technological adv advancements, you say. So I think it's pretty remarkable. Now, now that we feel a little excited about this image generation models and video generation models, I wanted to you know, touch base on how they work, 
but very briefly because we won't have time to go over all the gory details of diffusion models. So I like to think of diffusion models uh, as, uh, as the following. So what happens when we try to refine noise so that it becomes a realistic image? And let's just consider image generation uh, for the moment. So here's an infographic of it, of the process, the denoising process. As we can see, we are starting off from a noise vector, a pure Gaussian random noise vector. And then over a period of time, we are trying to denoise it so that it becomes a realistic image. And then you have got another infographic, which probably shows it a little better. And as we can see, it's a sequential process. We are starting off with noise, and then over a period of a couple of iterations, we are denoising it. It's, it's essentially a denoising process, but a lot more complexity is thrown to the mix. And then we stop until and unless we get that cute cat. So, yeah. And when we try to condition this denoising process with something like text, we get this little furry monsters. And again, I would like to emphasize that in reality, we think, I think we all can agree that this, these creatures won't really exist, uh, but these models have this ability to you know, you know, parse the input prompt and give us something meaningful and as realistic as this one. So yeah. And also the promise of flexibility that we get with diffusion models is like crazy. We saw text to image, which is like take an input prompt as text from the user and generate an image that's well and shiny. But we can do a lot more. What if I wanted, wanted the system to also follow some kind of visual cues uh, alongside the textual prompt? What, wh what if I wanted the system to also follow certain kind of pose? Like for example, I wanted to make Darth Vader dan dance in a particular pose, and that's possible. It's possible to you know, inject multiple controls in a diffusion model. We can also do stuff like in-painting, which is highly relevant in the media and content industry, which is to say, I wanted to edit a particular part of an image. I wanted to basically replace it with something else, and it's possible. And in the right-hand side image, we can see the, the castle uh, getting a new look. So that's image in-painting. We can do image editing with natural language uh, instructions as well. No need to do you know, complex Adobe Photoshop hacks. It's possible to you know, put in a little mustache in this uh, little creature just by specifying an input prompt. How cool is that? Uh, that's possible. And so far, we have been talking about generative aspects of these systems a lot. What if we wanted these systems to become more discriminative in nature? For example, depth estimation, highly, highly relevant for robotic perception tasks, which kind of gives us a sense of real-time depth. Depth estimation is possible with diffusion models. And then what if we wanted to detect objects with natural language instructions? Let's say in this image, I wanted to detect all the drinks. It's possible. See the contour lines in the right-hand side image? That's the detection results. So, which is to say discriminative you know, representation learning is also possible with diffusion models, not just generation. So I think this is quite exciting. And coming to the real world use cases, because at the end of the day, we want to make money, we want to make dollars, uh, and diffusion models are quite, quite into the industry already, despite being so new. Uh, so we can Im Im immediately imagine, you know, use cases like uh, interior design, maybe I, I visited my friend and I really liked their interior design and why I wanted something similar. And diffusion models can help us plan those things. And fashion branding, I think Amazon, Nika, they are already using diffusion models qua, 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 quite a lot, but here's, here's a real use case as well. And then goes without saying that, you know, this, this models also helps break these models help break the creative boundaries. And OpenAI actually did a formal study uh, with, with lots of artists from all across the globe to see how these models were able to you know, uh, break their writer's block and give them you know, creative inspirations to uh, do their next generation of work. So I think collectively speaking, these are on the rise. Diffusion models are on the rise. And I think they're, uh, they're here to stay. 
Now, coming to, coming, to, uh, coming to the more technical aspects of my talk, I wanted to start by giving you a couple of names which we are probably already familiar with. For example, DALI3 from OpenAI, Imagine from Google, Stable Diffusion Excel, the Stable Diffusion family from Stability AI. Then we have got Mochi1 uh, from the Genmo folks. So these are very popular uh, diffusion models that we have probably heard of. I, I haven't included Midjourney because Midjourney is really black box. We do not know if it's a diffusion model in the first place. So I didn't want it to get too far ahead of my head. But not all these models are open. Of course, DALI3 is not open. Imagine is not open. But many of the models that I have enlisted are actually open, which is pretty cool. And why care about the openness in the first place? Because we want to be able to study the risk factors. We want to be able to study the failure cases of this model so, they, so that we deploy them safely and responsibly as possible. And we also want to build on top of them, right? Because if, if the giants you know, decide to keep their shoulders private, we won't be able to build on top of their shoulders. So I think stability, uh, stable diffusion from Stability AI, it, it, it's a great example. When Stable Diffusion was open sourced, I think it, it like created a huge spark in the community, which they were able to you know, take forward and improve it uh, quite, uh, quite significantly. So I think this is a perfect opportunity for me to introduce the library uh, that I get to work on at Hugging Face, which is the Diffuses library. And it's a Python open source library with an Apache 2 license. It, we, and, and here are a couple of goals that we want to establish uh, with the library. We want to provide open and responsible access to the state-of-the-art pre-trained diffusion models. But we also want to democratize the ecosystem, the complex e ecosystem of diffusion models by providing easy to use APIs. And I'm going to get to the complex uh, nature of diffusion models in a bit. So uh, hold on to that. So let me give you some no frills code examples first, uh, and then we'll talk. Because show me the code. So yeah. I care about indentation and co code cleanliness. That's why probably I took more than five lines of code. But you can imagine you know, wrapping it up within four lines of code. And that's exactly what it takes to generate an image from a textual prompt with diffusers. And this is the Flux model from, from Black Forest Labs. So all the bleeding at stuff. So again, a baby astronaut, you know, imaginary things, but possible. Uh, and again, four lines of code, and you are already up and running. And you might think that we talked about video generation models. Video would be different. We might need complicated APIs to do generate videos. But really, it's the same APIs. It's the same four lines of code. We have changed the checkpoints. We have changed a couple APIs, but that's it. Same five lines of code, and we have a video where Darth Vader is actually surfing. It's not a static image. I I'm able to make Darth Vader surf. So I think it's pretty cool as well. And again, the APIs remain exactly the same. And it's the Mochi, Mochi1 uh, video generation model, which is state of the art uh, as of today. It's from Genmo. So available in diffusers. And since we are talking about video generation models, and videos, I think, are one of the most complicated forms of modalities to work with, uh, I also wanted to harp on this uh, note a bit, because we have now a couple of video generation models uh, within the Diffuses library, Animate Diff, Personalized Image Generator, Cog Video X, and then uh, there's Stable Video Diffusion as well. So feel free to check it out if it suits your uh, use cases and projects. And then uh, I also wanted to actually Darth Vader dance using a pose along uh, a textual description. And it's possible with the library. It's possible with a method called text to video zero. And the reason why I specifically wanted to mention this method is because it allows us to take a 2D image model, do some stuff on its, on its internals, and let's it, let's it generate videos. So imagine taking a model that can generate image can also generate videos without having to do any, any, any kind of expensive training. Of course, it has limitations, like it can't generate beyond 16 frames videos, but I think it's a good possibility and direction to keep in mind. 
And then there are many more tasks that we support in the Diffuses library, such as image inpainting, image variation, image editing, video to video generation, and text to audio generation uh, as well. So the library is not particularly for image generation, but we support other modalities such as audio, video, and 3D projections as well. And we have got two backends. One is PyTorch, another one is Jax. So I think that's pretty exciting. If you want to you know, chug TPUs, then probably the Jax backend is for you. And then we also support quantization quite natively. Uh, and I'm going to come to why we support quantization natively in a moment. And that's because modern models like Stable Diffusion 3.5, Flux, Mochi, these are all very, very memory hungry models. Right? And it can be pretty challenging to run them on consumer uh, GPU cards, like having 24 gigs of memory. That's why we provide native quantization support. So quantization is basically a technique that lets you express data in fewer bits, uh, thereby cu uh, cu cu cutting your memory requirements quite a bit. And, and it's also easy to uh, use quantization support. We first specify a quantization config with a quantization backend. In this case, we are using the bits and bytes quantization backend. And then while instantiating our models, uh, we just specify the config and everything's done for you. And while initializing the diffusion system, we just pass on that quantized model and everything will be taken care of for you. And there's lots to, lots to explore here. That's why I have provided links to some of the most important pieces of documentation. And as mentioned earlier, I'm going to share my slides after the end of my talk, so you do not have to note it down. And then with, I wanted to also in, uh, highlight this note. It's only because of quantization. It's possible to run you know, large models like Mochi 1 and also Stable Diffusion 3.5 Flux under a free tier Colab notebook, which comes with just 16 GBs of RAM. Otherwise, it would have taken like 80 GBs at least. So, yeah. And then coming to the more Pythonic aspects of the library, I wanted to start by mentioning configuration management. Because unlike language models, diffusion models, it's not just about a single model. We have got multiple text encoders. We have got a diffusion backbone. And then for latent space diffusion models, we have got a decoder. And then we have got a non-parametric component, which is called scheduler. So we have got at least four or five components into the picture when you want to generate a realistic, aesthetic uh, image, unlike language models, which is most probably in all the cases is just about a single model. But diffusion systems are not like that. There are many models underlying a diffusion system. And then let me also give you uh, a quick rundown of how, how these components are kind of interconnected. So let's say I want to get from that text a cat looking like a tiger and from that generated image. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pass this prompt to a series of text encoders, get some intermediate representation out. I'm going to pass that intermediate representation to my diffusion backbone. Architectures don't matter here for the sake of the argument. And then I'm going to repeat that denoising process, something we discussed just a couple slides ago. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run the denoising process, maybe, maybe for 50, 50 iterations, with the scheduler. And then I'm going to pass the final representation to the decoder to get my final image out. See, as, you, as we can see, there are multiple model level components involved. It's not just about a single model. So that's it. And one thing is, is that the text encoders, it can be of different sizes. The diffusion backbone, the denoising backbone, they can have different architectures. The scheduler, it can have many different arguments, but it's, it does not contain any weight and data. So that's something to take note of. So practically, it doesn't have any size, so to speak. And then the decoder part, it can also uh, come in different shapes, forms, uh, and architectures. So we, we keep the model parameters and configuration separate from each other, which is to say, if I loaded if I, if I loaded a particular model from a pre-trained checkpoint, I should be able to access its config with this config attribute. And it's going to print something like this. 
So that's why I mentioned we keep the model parameters and the configurations fully separate. So if we go into the pre-trained checkpoint, we will see, we can expect to see the parameters being distributed separately from the model config. And which is, which is why we can also load from a pre-trained config. What if we do not want, what if we do not want to use the pre-trained parameters, we just want to use the configuration to do some other stuff. That is also po possible. And here we are using the load configuration method you, instead of using the from pre-trained method. So that basically gives me a model with the same configurations as my pre-trained model, but com with completely random, randomly initialized weights. And then, I, of course, I can pass pass in my own custom arguments. If, uh, what if I wanted to use the pre-trained configuration partially, and I wanted to sort of combine it with my uh, custom arguments as well? And that's possible too. And we can also, you know, reuse components in order to save memory. That is to say, if I wanted to use components that have like overlaps with some other, you know, diffusion systems, I can I can use the components from a previously initialized diffusion system uh, to initialize the current one without having to reinitialize them. So that saves quite a lot of memory. And then we can also combine this, you know, philosophy of reusing components with some custom ones. What if I wanted to, you know, uh, reuse some of the uh, some of the components, but also initialize my custom ones? That's also possible. So you have a lot of flexibility when you are dealing with the models that can be underlying a diffusion system. So yeah, we we can also swap pipeline level components because we just learned that we have got text encoders, we have got diffusion backbones. If, then we have got decoders, and then we have got schedulers. So in the diffusion pipeline class, you can also you know, pro supply your own custom components if you wanted to experiment with something. In this case, I'm passing a separate you know, unit component. It can be a transformer component as well, as long as the underlying checkpoint supports it. So just, just a couple of notes here. Uh, we, we keep seeing the diffusion pipeline class and just, just a couple of details here about that class. So diffusion pipeline, it basically encapsulates the logic of the entire diffusion process. It involves several components, like the diffusion network, the text encoders, the, the scheduler, and the decoder. So we can swap any of these components as long as they are, com they are compatible uh, in an inter interconnected manner. So that's something to keep in mind. And I mentioned these components are swappable. So as long as you can ensure compatibility, you can basically swap out everything. Here I am only using the decoder from the pre-trained checkpoint, which is SDXL in my case, but I'm using separate unit, I'm using a separate text encoder, I'm using a separate scheduler. So all of those things are possible. And we strive to be as explicit as possible over being uh, implicit, by, and that is to say, by default, all the diffusion pipelines and models are loaded on the CPU with the floating point 32 precision. And you, as a user, you need to do the device placement and the, uh, and the type casting explicitly. We do not do that for you. And that, that's by design. That's like following the PyTorch philosophy of uh, the user's ex uh, user exp experience. And here's what I mean. Here, I'm specifically, I'm, I'm explicitly specifying the computation type as well as which device the, uh, to load the model onto. So this is something you explicitly need to do. It's not something the library will do it for you. So yeah. And also simple over easy, something to uh, you know keep in mind because diffusion models as mentioned earlier, they can be pretty computationally expensive to run and we do not perform any optimization if you do not request for it because explicitness. And then performing, performing them is pretty simple thanks to the API design. I'm gonna show you how. So consider the stable diffusion three pipeline for a bit. Without any optimization, it takes about 19 GBs on the GPU, uh, on the GPU memory without any optimizations. And if we offload some of the components to the CPU, and if we load them GPUs when they are needed, we can reduce the memory requirement down to about 13 gigs. 
Again, just a simple one-liner code, but you have to call it yourself. We are not going to call it until and unless you request for it. So simple, but you have to do it. Yeah. And minimal abstractions, because we are, a, we, are, we, are a, uh, we are fans of minimalism, so we try to keep the abstraction levels of our library down to a bare minimum. All our model classes extend from framework primitives. That is to say, for our PyTorch backend, we extend from the nn.module class. And then for Flax, uh, we, because we have a Jax and Flax backend, we extend from the Linen package. And then we do not have any implicit contract with the core uh, framework level functionalities. That's why we are able to provide greater control to the user because we extend from the framework, uh, 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 framework primitives. That, and we do not make any explicit uh, or implicit contract with this framework primitives. So that's it. Now there's more to it, diffuses. Uh, probably I gave you an idea about the diffusers library, but I only talked about the inference related bits. But it's it's not not just an inference tool. We there's more to it. We provide all the composable blocks you need for your diffusion research. There's all kinds of training examples within the library, and we try to ensure memory friendliness with, within the library. Some of which I showed during my presentation, like quantization. CPU offloading and so on, because we can't be assuming that everyone will have access to 80 GB uh, GPUs. That's why we try to make it as memory friendly and as accessible as possible. Uh, our philosophy document, because I went over some of the philosophical bits of the library, like simple over easy, explicit over implicit, we have got an entire philosophy document uh, up here if you want to uh, give it a read. But yeah, I think I finished right in time. Uh, I have got plenty of time to take questions and hopefully provide you with answers. If you if you wanted to get access to the slides, just scan the QR and yeah, that should cut it. I can take questions now. Hi, thank you for the interesting presentation. My name is Fortnand Chair from Honda. So. Sorry? Um, uh, my name is Tino from Honda. Hi. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I have a question related to the diffusers library. So do you support uh, model parallelism in case you have, you know, small GPUs with not a lot of memory and you just, you know, want to compute on those? So the question is, if diffusers support model parallelism, mm -hmm. and if the if the way you want to do model parallelism, it's say, let's say you have a pool of GPUs, but each GPU has like very limited amount of memory and you wanted to shard the model across those low memory GPUs. Is that correct? Correct. We support it. Thanks. So if you, if you go to this slide, uh, here uh, we have detail about everything, like how to uh, parallelize the flux model and run uh, inference across different GPUs. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, I think there's a quick uh, uh, Thank you for your presentation. Uh, it was really interesting. Thank I have a question about, uh, uh, that about the diff users. I mean, the, you said that the diff users can uh, uh, composite a lot of components related to the pipeline, like noise scheduler and text encoders. And yes, it is. Uh, I believe we, you can do that. But the, then the next question is: uh, is uh, how can we check uh, those uh, each component can uh, better work with each other? I mean, if if switching to another comp another model or another encoders can uh, may may lead to a, a, a degradation on the quality of the output. So, is there a better way in? Uh, is, is it, does uh, diffusers provide any kind of way to uh, trace the uh, degrada uh, degradation, uh, degradation of the quality of the output, or uh, can, it, can it guide some kind of uh, chips, or I mean, the guide to, uh, not, not, to not prevent not happening, uh, not leading to uh, degradation? Uh, uh, that's a good question. Uh, if I understood it correctly, the question is, 
since we support swapping different components within a diffusion pipeline, how can we ensure that swapping a certain component with another is not leading to degradations and what we can do from the library side to prevent that from happening, correct? correct? So one, I think if you are swapping out important components like a diffusion backbone, you should always, always evaluate your entire pipeline on some standard benchmarks, such as party prompt or draw bench or Genival or something like that. And we have got a little documentation section in our official docs that talks about evaluating diffusion models. And it's also because we are very explicit in nature, we assume that users will know what they are doing when they are swapping a particular component within a pipeline. So we do not explicitly say that, hey, you should, shouldn't probably uh, swap out this component. But if we, you know, if we, if, we, if we detect any incompatible configurations, we log it on the console of the user that, hey, you have enabled this. Please be sure that this can lead to unexpected performance degradations. So I think a couple of factors here. One, I think it's on the user side to ensure they are evaluating their pipelines as rigorously as possible with respect to their use cases. And second, by making the obvious warnings as explicitly available po as possible to the users, I think we make them aware that, hey, this is probably a little incompatible in nature. You should probably take another look. So I think those are some of the ways. So basically, it, it is the user's responsibility to uh, is, is, it, is it a user's responsibility to adjust, uh, 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 to keep, keep the quality of the output, uh, correct? When you are swapping, swapping components, for the most part, yes. But for, for, for like the obvious misconfigurations, we try to log as much as possible. I see, I see. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, the output of this diffusion model is very impressive and more and more realistic. Yeah. Uh, but how to control the randomness? For instance, you sh yeah, this example is very nice. So you show it the, how you can generate image that follow the body pose. Yeah. Uh, I wonder uh, how, what kind of other control you can add to control the output and how sophisticated it can go. <laughs> Yeah, that, that, that's a very good question. If I understood it correctly, uh, the question is, what kind of controls I can inject when generating an image, for example, apart from the textual description, is that correct? So this is one, you can inject pose information. Similarly, similar to poses, you can also inject segmentation maps, or even depth maps, or even CanEH filters, uh, or even bounding boxes. Let's say you wanted a cat and a dog to, you know, be located in certain kind of locations within an image. You can specify bounding box information as well. And then you can also supply a whole image, which like if you wanted to do image to image translation, maybe you wanted a very similar face to mine, but you wanted to change certain aspects. That's also possible. So like not just, you know, pose level or depth map level control, but also fully image level control, like you wanted to use images just like you use textual prompts, more like using image prompts. So using that is also possible. Uh, and also for video generation, you can generate a video from a single image and you can also generate a video from a video, more like video to video synthesis. So lots of, uh, you know, controls that are available, but I highly recommend you to check out this paper which like goes over a lot of gory details. It's called Omnigen. Like it basically gives you all the details about the ways a diffusion model can be controlled and how can you sort of approach the process in a very systematic manner. Thank you. Any more questions? I wanted to show the model sharding documentation. Uh, um, 
Tino, was that right? So this is the documentation where we show parallelism. So, cool, yeah, yeah. If, you, if you are unable to find it, just open an issue on our repository, I'll get back to you right away. Um, I'll go around the room for five seconds to see if there's any question. Are there, oh, okay, there's a question. So very simple question. Um, you show the uh, quantization Quantization sample. So, the uh, what's the maximum the quantization? Because currently we have a binary the model. Yeah. Sometimes uh, it's a very uh, hot topic. So yeah. I'm interested in the uh, in the uh, such a uh, diffusion model. The how much the uh, minimum uh, model we, can we uh, create it. That, that, that's, a, that's a good question. If I understood it correctly, what's the lowest quantization primitive that you can afford for diffusion models, right? Of course, we are in the one-bit language model territory, so your question is very, very valid. The problem with diffusion model is, especially the diffusion models that are, that are for image generation, is that because image, video, and audio, these are all continuous forms of modalities, if you quantize it, a little too aggressively, the quality can degrade a whole lot. So either you will have to do some kind of quantization aware training, but the commonly practiced uh, quantization type is the NF4 type, uh, so normalized float 4. NF4 is a very popular one these days, uh, so, but there are other exotic floating point uh, quantization types as well, such as FP8, there's FP6, uh, to like, you can do all sorts of stuff on the mantissa part of the uh, floating point precision, right? So that's there as well. But just to cut the story short, NF4 is probably the lowest quantization type that the community has uh, has grown fond of. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. I think we have got time for one last question, and then be then I'll be out of your way. Any last questions I can take? Oh. All right, I'll, I'll be here. So I'll if see. no one, can I ask one question? Oh, please go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I think you already mentioned about the omni, uh, omni data generation, but so input and output should be very various, can be very various format, of course, not limited to image or video. So how will you support those additional formats? Radio? In, no, no, uh, I mean, yeah, we're, is there any plan for diffusers to support uh, support multiple input and out, outputs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or so Omnigen will soon be uh, available in diffusers. We are working with the first author of Omnigen. So that way, as inputs, we can take multiple images so that we can perform something like in-context learning. And uh, we, we should be able to output multiple images as well. We al already support outputting multiple images because videos are a form of multiple frames sort of stitched together in a special temporal manner. But it's about, the, it, it's about supporting multiple inputs. We support it for certain kinds of pipelines, such as IP adapters. We let you, you know, pass in multiple images. Uh, but the control that you are mentioning, I think it's going to have to come with Omnigen. It's going to be available soon. But know that some pipelines already support it, such as IP adapters. Oh, then how about other outputs, such as, for example, Molecular or something like that? Oh, yeah, we have an experimental pipeline for molecular stuff uh, in our documentation. It's not full-fledged yet, because the research around molecular generation with diffusion models has been a little scarce compared to video generation models and image generation models. But it's there, and experimental pipeline is there. I see, thanks. It's very interesting. Thanks. All right, I think I still have a minute left, but I'll leave you to it. And okay, thanks for attending my presentation.